Hello, welcome along. My name's Dan. This is the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for downloading and streaming and playing however you found us. Thank you very much for doing so. Uh, now, what we do here uh, couldn't be simpler. All we try and do is learn every single mystery that the universe has ever presented and try and figure it out for ourselves, okay? I mean, if it's something sciencey, then we care what it is. This week, it's strange, we've got a dangerous down that is so complicated, you need to like properly switch your brain on. Uh, just talking about it is going to send me in a spin, I know. Uh, the thing is, what's strange is that it's just an idea. We don't know if it's even real yet, so that's what's amazing. Uh, we'll also talk about a new mission to get close to the sun, and we'll hear some terrible news about bumblebees. That's on the way. Uh, we've got questions today too, your questions, your science questions, all about the curve of the Earth, about fight or flight, and about the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. That's on the way. First, let's get a lesson from the smartest school outside of the solar system. This is Professor Pulsar. Deep Space High, Destination Mars. Jump into a wormhole and travel to deep space high. The school is in space, but hurry, because lessons are about to begin. Afternoon, everyone. We're in the robotics laboratory today because we're going to start getting to grips with designing a robot that can withstand the conditions on Mars. Like the ExoMars rover? That's one of the robots they're sending to Mars in the next few years. That's right. We'll be looking at the ExoMars rover's design features to learn more. Now, zip up, everyone. The demo's about to begin. Oh, it's so cold, so cold, so cold. It's freezing. That's right. The temperature is now minus 75 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature of a Martian night in the middle of summer. Summer? Remind me not to book a holiday to Mars. Now, have a look at some of these materials. As you can see, the icy temperatures are making them stiff and brittle. Uh-oh. I don't think they'll be much good on a Mars rover. I suppose you need to build the rover out of strong and heavy lumps of metal. Not if you want to get it off the ground. That's right, Stats. Whilst the materials have to be strong to withstand those temperatures, they also need to be light. Moving a heavy object takes more energy than a lighter one, and the rover will need to use its energy carefully. Any idea what materials might fit the bill? Something strong but light? My Neptunian yak cheese munchables? They're certainly strong. Poo hoo! They're very light. Anyone want one? <laughs> Not that kind of strong. And no eating in the lab, please. Materials often used include carbon fibre and titanium. But, sir, electrical circuits and delicate instruments might not work at all in those temperatures, even if nothing is broken. Things like electrical circuitry don't like getting hot then cold over and over again. A lot of materials, when they get warm, they expand, and when they get cold, they shrink. And that movement can make the materials weak. That's right. We've experienced how cold it gets during a Martian night. Let's turn the temperature up to what it's like during a nice summer's day. Still pretty cold. The thermostat says minus five degrees Celsius. That's as cold as winter on Earth. The temperature on Mars changes around 70 degrees each day in the summer and more in the winter. Any ideas how we solve the problem? Keep the rover warm with a nice woolly scarf. I don't think that's going to be enough. But you're right, quote, keeping instruments warm is one way to protect them from the weather. Let's check it out. Some of the power that the rover's solar panels generate is used to heat the interior of the rover, where the instruments are. Some heat is also generated from the machinery itself. That also helps to keep things at a steady temperature. I've read that sometimes radioactive materials are used to power robots. That's certainly true, but radioactive material has to be handled very carefully and it's very expensive. Anything that can be done simply, like recycling heat that's already produced, is cheaper and safer. Not as cheap as knitting a lovely scarf. So we've seen that when building a rover, it's important to choose the materials carefully and think of ways to keep the instruments at a steady temperature and warm enough to keep them working correctly. And without knitting a woolly scarf. Deep Space High, Destination Mars. With support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkidslive.com. Slash space. 
Right, let's do some of your science questions then. If you've got anything sciencey that you want answered on the Spun Kids Science Weekly, it's kind of in the name. Uh, you need to leave it for me as a review over on Apple Podcasts. This is from Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Ryan asks, why does Earth not look round when you're standing on top of it? Well, it's because the slope of the Earth really is so gradual and so long. It happens, it curves over such a long distance that you don't really notice the change. And also, because everything is pulled down to the Earth, because of gravity, it's attracted to the centre. Nothing is at an odd angle, so it always looks like you're walking in a straight line. You know when you're in the ocean or maybe you're in the sky in a plane, and you see the horizon in the distance, well, that horizon is the Earth curving away as it's a ball. So you kind of notice it there, Ryan. Um, Thank you for the question. This one is from Lily. Lily, who says she is 12 and a half. Um, That's really important. Thank you, Lily. Lily asks, uh, why, when we get scared, do we get faster and stronger? Well, that'll be our fight or flight responses. We've had them since the beginning of time, really. I mean, imagine being a caveman and then suddenly you're faced with a massive tiger. You can either flight, you can leg it, jump up a tree, try and not get eaten by the tiger, or you can fight, pick up a club and try and bash it over the head as quickly as you can. What happens is your brain releases adrenaline. It's a hormone. Uh, It kind of puts your body into action. And it makes your heart rate increase, so you pump more blood around your body so you can keep full of energy. Your lungs take in air faster, you start panting, and that supplies the body with all that important oxygen to keep it going. Uh, Your pupils get larger, uh, so you can see better. Your digestive system slows down so that you can concentrate more. Uh, We don't do this all the time, it only happens during fight or flight moments, because it's really too exhausting for your body to keep up all the time, and it doesn't need to. Uh, And lastly... This is from Dylan in Cumbria, it's a good one, uh, who asks, how far the meteor was going that killed off the dinosaurs? Now, scientists think that the meteor hit Earth at a speed of 12.4 miles a second. I shouted that for emphasis. It's 20 times faster than a speeding bullet. It generated a force 1 billion times greater than an atomic bomb. It was the size of the Isle of Wight. A big island off the coast of the UK, and it, and it crash landed in uh, Chicxulub, which is in Mexico. Uh, thank you so much for that question, Dylan. 12.4 miles a second. Remember, if you've got something sciencey that you want answered on this show, you need to leave it for me as a review over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, this year marks the 200th anniversary of the first official human sighting of Antarctica. A British ship under the command of Edward Bransfield was the first to spot it. And we're finding out more about what they did when they were down there and why they went there and what they've got planned to celebrate this year with uh, the CEO of the United Kingdom Antarctic Heritage Trust, Camilla Nicholl. Thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you? Yeah, I'm really well. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, So if we go back to the first time that we, we spotted it as a continent, did Edward Bransfield know much about what he was going to find. Was this the purpose of the trip? Was he kind of floating by and saw it? Can you talk us about that discovery first? Sure. Well, Edward Bransfield uh, was following up on a, an expedition that had happened the previous, um, the previous year. So the, in 1819, um, William Smith, another mariner on, a, on the same ship, actually, he spotted the South Shetland Islands. So these are a, an archipelago of islands just off the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, he found those. Um, but the conditions were getting so bad that he he had to turn around. So he had to return to Chile, uh, to Valparaiso, um, and sort of check back in. Um, but he, he announced that he'd found these islands. Now, up to, up to that point, people had predicted there must be a continent down there, right back to the ancient Greeks. They thought there was a continent uh, in, in the Antarctic in, in opposition to the Arctic at the top. Um, Captain Cook, 50 years earlier, had had a go at trying to find Antarctica. He managed to circumnavigate it but never actually saw it, frustratingly. But in 1819, William Smith found the South Shetland Islands, and um, the powers that be instructed Bransfield to take the ship again and see if they could find Antarctica. So it was a mission to find it. Um, and if he did find it, he had to keep it secret until he got back and he could uh, inform the authorities. And that's what he did. So they were there, uh, they were following a similar route to uh, William Smith, and they, well, they revisited the South Shetland Islands, and they went beyond them. And on the 30th of January, 1820, they spotted the Antarctic Peninsula and named it Trinity Land. 
In terms of discoveries, what Neil Armstrong and the crew of Apollo 11 did on the moon is very well known. What did Edward Bransfield do when he found Antarctica, even though he couldn't tell anyone else? What, what did he do, do when he actually... Did, did he make contact? Did he get uh, climb uh, off the ship onto uh, the land? No, he didn't, actually. He just um, recorded that they found it, um, and actually those records no longer exist. Unfortunately, his logbook was lost, so we rely on records from other sailors on the ship. Um, but no, they didn't make land, uh, make landing on Antarctica for another six months. So it wasn't until the following Antarctic season, the next Antarctic summer in November time, that anybody was able to set foot in Antarctica. So he recorded it and then he, he hot-footed it back to Valparaiso and uh, let the authorities know what he'd found. But what he didn't know was there was also a Russian expedition that was doing the same thing. And three days earlier, um, they had spotted an, an ice shelf in a different part of Antarctica. But they didn't realise they'd found Antarctica and didn't write it down. And it wasn't until afterwards that we have kind of retrospectively looked at the records and gone, actually, uh, Bellinghausen on this Russian expedition also spied Antarctica within the same week. How much of the continent is still a mystery to us? Very little now, because we have satellites, of course. Um, but in terms of how much has been trod by human foot, very little. Um, the peninsula is, is very well understood, and that's where a lot of human activity goes on, a lot of the science stations are on the peninsula. It is the, it is the easiest part of Antarctica to get to, because it's, it's proximity to South America. But there are other places, like the, the Ross Sea, which is the opposite side of Antarctica from the peninsula, which is where the famous uh, explorers like Scott Shackleton and Amundsen, um, they uh, conducted their heroics at the turn of the 20th century from there. But there are stations all over. Famously, there's a station at South Pole, um, and there's the coldest place on Earth, which is Vostok Station, the Russian station. Um, so there's then lots of bits of Antarctica are very well understood, but we now know an awful lot more about it using great satellite technology. And we have special satellites that study ice and study Antarctica specifically, so we can get a really good view of uh, what Antarctica's peaks and troughs are. How important is it to the world as a continent? Antarctica is incredibly important now. Um, not only is it the most recently discovered continent, uh, but and probably the least well understood, um, it is also the place where um, all the climate science is going on. The impacts of climate change are being most keenly felt there. So the Antarctic Peninsula is one of the fastest warming places on the planet. We just had a report recently that it's warmed to three degrees in the last um, several years. So it's a very important barometer of, of, of climate change. It's also where incredible cutting-edge science is going on by a range of nations. Um, it also has this extraordinary kind of political status. So nobody lives there, nobody owns Antarctica, but there's this treaty called the Antarctic Treaty, which 54 countries have signed up to that protects Antarctica for peace and science. And that's unique in the world. And that's a wonderful model for when we're thinking about exploring other places in the universe like Mars or the Moon and how you might govern those places. And you are the CEO of the United Kingdom Antarctic Heritage Trust. What is it that you do? I know that you manage Port Lockroy, which is a British base down there. What is it that you're doing? What is your mission of being on Antarctica? Indeed. So we're the Heritage Trust. So we don't actually do um, a lot of science, particularly. But what we do is we look after the heritage. So if you think about, we are equivalent to the National Trust for Antarctica, if you like. So we look after six historic bases which um, were date back to the 1940s. So the very first one, uh, Port Lockway, was, was in, uh, established in 1944 during the Second World War. And that was the very first British science station that had people wintering in it. So they stayed there over the winter. And this was a really important moment in both British Antarctic exploration, but also in, in Antarctic history. <clears throat> So Port Lockway was the first, was, it was Base A, and it's the first place of the British Antarctic Survey, which you'll know about today. And then the other sites we have are, are sites that, uh, historic um, stations that were put in since then, since Port Lockway was built. And they tell a story of British Antarctic scientific endeavour in Antarctica. So they tell stories of climate science, of dog sledding and mapping, of geology, of heroics of uh, people over the second half of the 20th century. Um, and it's the foundations of this extraordinary science that we rely on today to understand our world. You mentioned geology there. It must be yeah. s such a, an amazing place to look at the history of the world, possibly more so than any other, because so much of the rock there has been you know, locked down by ice for so many years. I know you're a geologist yourself. Uh, uh -huh. how, how much have we learned about the, the fabric of the earth from studying, the, from studying the rocks? 
An awful lot. Um, Antarctica is, a, is an ancient continent, so it was part of Gondwana land, which is when um, a number of the continents, uh, uh, the continents on the Earth were, were stuck together before they moved apart uh, through plate tectonics. Um, famously, we, under, we understand that because of the um, fossils brought back um, by the, the team that accompanied Captain Scott when he uh, reached the South Pole, but unfortunately he didn't make it back. But he found, or his, his men found, uh, fossil plants called Glossopteris, which are also found in other continents. And it sh- showed that the Antarctica must have been stuck to another continent at some time in the past. So it was another clue that plate tectonics and the continental drift was happening. There's also extraordinary other geology, because it, 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 it's such a vast continent, it's uh, one and a half times the size of the North America. Um, it's vast and ancient. You have uh, very old rocks there. You have very young rocks there. You have live volcanoes uh, going off there. So you've got the oldest and the youngest rocks um, all going on. So for, for the geologist, it's a paradise. It's so amazing, isn't it, that this, you know, that, that this history is right there in front of our eyes. I'm just, I'm just constantly amazed by it. Now, I know that you, you guys at the the UK, uh, what do we say, the UK AHT, that you're celebrating this year um, uh, with quite a lot going on all around the UK. It, it's programs and events called Antarctica in Sight. Can you tell us a little bit more about those? Yeah, we do. Um, so uh, whilst unfortunately the UK AHT, we don't have any museums or, or places here. We are partnering up with um, all sorts of organisations across the UK to celebrate this 200th anniversary. What we think is it, it's so important is 200 years of human activity in Antarctica. We can pause, we can t- reflect on those 200 years because actually humans have, be- have behaved both well and not so well down in Antarctica in those 200 years. Um, and we can also take a moment to consider the future. So we've invited artists, and historians and scientists and young people, all sorts of people and writers to join us um, to explore Antarctica in different ways. So it might be through music, it might be through art exhibitions, it might be through sound, uh, it might be through lectures and, and workshops and we're going to have a children's summit, a climate summit in, in Hull later in the year. So there's all sorts of things going on at, that enable people to think about Antarctica or all ages, to think about Antarctica anew, to explore the science, to explore the history, to explore the future, and to maybe think about what kind of Antarctica we're handing on to the next generation, um, and so that they, the next generation might look after it maybe a little better than we have. I'm sure you can find out all about those if you look up the UK AHT. Lastly, Camilla, um, how easy is it for me right now in the UK to go to Antarctica? I mean, it's not as simple as, you know, buying a flight that I could do this second to Tenerife or something like that. How, how much, what's the logistics involved in getting there? Yeah, um, it's, 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 it's easier than you might think, but it's, um, yeah, you need to set aside a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks um, for, for the trip. Uh, but what you need to do, if you, the easiest way, is to fly down to Argentina and pick up a cruise ship in a place called Ushuaia, which is uh, in the southernmost tip of Argentina. Uh, that'll take you two days across the Drake Passage, which is the most notorious waterway on Earth, which T- is where convergence of three oceans. So tell us what happens there. Waters. What, 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 so you've got three... Yeah, sorry. Um, you have three oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific and the Southern Ocean, all converging just, uh, just south of uh, the tip of South America. Uh, and what you're getting is these ferocious waters, um, these, these uh, oceans meeting. And what you're getting is, is wild and very large waves and, and swell. Uh, but also what you're getting is great updrafts of nutrients. Um, so, which is which means you do get some fantastic wildlife because the the krill and things are coming to the surface, and who comes to look to eat them? The whales and seabirds and um, things like that. So, you, you get some extraordinary wildlife, but um, you do have to uh, keep yourself steady sometimes over the Great Passage. It can be pretty wild. And then we just get the boat straight straight to where you are. Yeah, so it's two days over the Drake Passage. Uh, another day will get you to the Antarctic Peninsula, and probably another day will get you to Port Lockroy, where we will welcome you and um, help you send a postcard. <laughs> Amazing. Um, brilliant. Yeah, if you want to find out more about everything that's going on, um, look up the United Kingdom Antarctic Heritage Trust. Uh, you've got it all there. Uh, Camilla, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. It's time for this week's Dangerous Dan which is quite a complicated one, okay? So so do your best to listen up, keep your mind open, pay attention. It could take your brain a while to get your head around it. And it's about something that is so strange, scientists think that it could bend the very rules of the universe. You see, when a star collapses in on itself or when it explodes in a supernova, all the protons and the electrons of the atom that are left behind are squeezed tight into each other because of gravity. 
And this makes what scientists call a neutron star. Now, because there's so much inside this neutron star that isn't supposed to be there, the core of the neutron star bends the rules of physics. And in that core, you also get quarks, which are tiny things that make up atoms atoms and and protons. Protons are neutrons, sorry. They are the building blocks of those. Uh, And these quarks were around just after the Big Bang, so seeing them, if you could, is kind of like looking back at the dawn of time. Have you got your head around that? And that's just half of it, keep going. (laughs) Scientists think that when these quarks come together, you get something called strange matter. That's what they call it, strange matter. I mean, you've heard of dark matter before. This is strange matter. They think it's like the perfect state of matter. It's perfectly dense, perfectly stable. And because it's so perfect, it might be infectious. When another bit of matter touches this strange matter, it could also become strange matter. Now, that would be fine because it's just in the core of these neutron stars. I mean, surely it can't get loose and infect the whole universe. Well, you're wrong. Because if two neutron stars collided... They, almost, they would almost crack, and it could send this strange matter across the galaxies. Think what would happen if it hit the Earth. It would turn us into strange matter. Same, uh, same with the sun, same with everything. And have a listen to this. Scientists think the only way to save the universe, to get rid of this strange matter, is to chuck it into a black hole. Now, the thing is, this is only an idea, but it's an idea based on proper theory, proper experiments that they've done, stuff that they have seen. This strange matter might actually exist, and if it does, it's hugely dangerous. Now, Usborne's new book, Lift the Flap, Questions and Answers About Plastic, is sponsoring this week's Science Weekly podcast. Uh, It's all about plastic and why it's in our lives, why we use it, but also the harmful effects that it has. Like, did you know that crisp packets don't actually rot away? And that most plastic litter isn't found underground, it's not found in our cities, it's actually found in our very oceans. Now, thing is, we can all help solve the plastic problem, and the new book, Lift the Flap, Questions and Answers About Plastic, contains loads of those solutions to help us out. You can get it online or in your favourite bookshop right now, and you can can head over to funkidslive.com to find out more. Right, let's get some of your gadget questions answered now. This is Techno Mum. Techno Mum's Tech Trivia with the Institution of Engineering Technology. Welcome back to Tech Trivia, the game show that tests the technical talents of our tremendous contestants. And playing this week, it's Techno Mum. I am excited to be back. I love a good quiz. Now you've been setting new supersonic records here at Tech Trivia, but can you hit the heights today? Let's find out and spin the wheel. And today's category is energy. Your time starts now. Your first question, why is energy important in technology? That's easy. Energy fuels our world. It powers factories, runs cars, heats our home, and keeps our gadgets working. Without it, well, we pretty much grind to a halt. Can you imagine a life without your tablet? What a terrible thought. But energy can be expensive. You'll know that if you've had to buy batteries for your toys or seen your parents pay for the fuel in the car. It can also create pollution which can harm the planet. That's why engineers are looking at ways to get new products to use the least possible energy while still delivering the experience that people want. That might be by designing new chips that can run using less energy, or technology that switches off a car engine when it's waiting at a traffic light, or light bulbs with sensors that only switch on when they detect someone moving nearby. You're off to a flying start. Next question. Name a cool innovation that's connected with energy. Well, what about electronic skin? Sounds a bit gruesome, but it's an invention that's being developed right now. It's not really skin, but solar power cells which are so thin and flexible that they can be put into clothing. Just imagine, your clothing could power your mobile phone. Electrifying techno mum. Next question. Name a tech job that's all about getting the most out of energy. Mm, Car engineers. They design engines that use less fuel or run on different types of fuel, like electricity instead of petrol or diesel. They also come up with ways for vehicles to cause less pollution, all without going any slower if at all possible. Well, you show no sign of slowing down. You're speeding through to the next round, Techno Mum. Great, I'm raring to go. 
Techno Mom's Tech Trivia with the Institution of Engineering Technology. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash tech trivia. It's time for this week's Science in the News. Europe's solar orbiter probe has lifted off. It's on a quest to study the sun from up close. The £1.3 billion mission is packed with cameras and sensors that should reveal new insights as to how the sun works. It will research the matter that the sun ejects into the atmosphere and it's matter that affects our satellites and radio communications. No one really has figured out why, so that's what it's hoping to do. Also, climate chaos has caused widespread losses of bumblebees across continents. Uh, scientists think that the reasons the likelihood of spotting a bee has declined by a third since the 70s is driven by climate change. Uh, and bees are a, the key pollinator of fruit and veg, so losing them is kind of a big deal. Uh, and also, the company OneWeb has sent 34 satellites into orbit on a single rocket from Kazakhstan. They're hoping to make a mega constellation in the sky of satellites that will hopefully deliver broadband uh, to all corners of the globe. So well done them. That was this week's Science in the News. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for having a listen. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on this show, you need to leave it for me as a review on Apple Podcasts for the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Look us up on there, leave your name, give us five stars so I can see you. There's a comment box at the bottom. That is where you leave your question, and I can't wait to see yours on there. Also, while you're on Apple Podcasts, it's one of the best places that you can see all of our science series, that you can hear them. You can get them there. You can get them on Google, on Spotify, and over on the free Fun Kids app. Now, Fun Kids, we're a children's radio station from the UK. You can listen to us all over the country on that app. We're on DAB Digital Radio as well, and we're at funkidslive.com. 